Good morning and welcome. Happy Father's Day to you on this Lord's Day, Sunday, June 19th, 2022. Let's pray together. We bow before you, Heavenly Father, for showing us who you are and for showing us what a good and great father can be. We thank you for every way you lead us and love us and provide for us and forgive us and discipline us. You are the best and the ideal father, and it's from you, all of us who are followers of Jesus and our fathers too want to learn. We want to learn about fatherhood from you. All of us, whether we're fathers or not, want to learn and have you lead us as father and want to learn how to follow a good and perfect father. So on this day especially, we thank you, uh, those of us who are fathers, for the privilege of being fathers. We thank you as well for the fathers you've had in our lives, some are fathers in flesh and some are uh, fathers in spirit. Your abundance has made not just this day, but our lives special. And we thank you in your name. Amen. Well, we're excited because we start a new series today. And that series is a survey of the book of Revelation, and we'll be in Revelation chapter 1 today, and I'm going to read to you Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest and to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash across his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you see, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Good morning, church. Good to be with you this morning. If you would, please join me in worship today. Wash away my sin. What can make me whole again? For my part in this I see. For my cleansing, this my plea.
death intersected from the depths resurrected hallelujah life and death intersected from the depths resurrected Let's pray together. Lord, on this Father's Day, we do want to thank you for the fathers in our lives. As I stated at the beginning of our service, we do have fathers that are fathers in flesh and fathers who are fathers in spirit. Some have given, of those who have given us spiritual mentoring, some of them have been practical mentoring, life mentoring, wisdom mentoring. And when it's added together, they've been a reflection of your fatherhood. All of those fathers are imperfect. You alone are perfect. All of us who are fathers have been imperfect. And yet by your grace, we have experienced this great honor and privilege to be in this role, a role that reflects you. Lord, we pray for our fathers today. Uh, we pray for those, first of all, who are fathers and families uh, serving their children. We pray that you'd give them grace and wisdom and maturity and strength and an ever-flowing abundance of love, unconditional love. Lord, we pray for those who serve as fathers in other ways. Some are mentors, some even are women, who in the life of someone who's needy, who lacks all fathers, provide that kind of insight and mentoring and leadership and guidance. Lord, bless all of these. Bless those who uh, are fathers and mentors and bless those who serve in that kind of way. Lord, we pray for each of us in our role as children. If we have uh, fathers living, we pray that we would deeply appreciate them we would reflect on how briefly we have them in our lives. And we pray that we would honor them and be shaped by them in ways that not just bring grat gratification and uh, satisfaction to them, but to you. Lord, our, our society lacks good fathers, fathers of flesh and fathers as mentors and so we pray that you would increase the number of those we pray you would alert us to the opportunities we have to serve that way and we pray that that critical role that critical type of love that critical type of patience that critical type of guidance that the tribe of those would increase here 
and around the world. Thank you, Lord, for being our Father. Thank you for the grace you show through fatherhood. Thank you that we have this day to reflect upon it, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is uh, Father's Day, so for my message today, I have brought with me my father's World War II dog tags. Uh, these dog tags were with him when he was 20 years old, and he was loaded on a Liberty ship and traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to Great Britain. These dog tags were around his neck when he climbed off a ship uh, and walked across the beaches in Normandy. He, they were with him in the cold uh, nights and days of the Battle of the Balch. They were with him when it wasn't uh, where he stayed in Europe as part of the occupying force and didn't return home until a year after the war in Europe was over in 1946. They were with him through all of that. And they always caused me to think about that generation, right? That generation, uh, so many of which have passed. My dad passed 46 years ago. And I frequently think about how the world would have been a different place if he and millions of others of men and women like him had not picked up arms and machine tools and beat back the scourge of Nazi tyranny. What a nightmare our world would be if we lived under Nazi domination with no self-determination, with no hope of freedom, with no regard for human dignity or human rights. It is unimaginable, but we have to try to understand that if we want to understand the world of the New Testament and the world in which the book of Revelation was written. We have to be able to try to imagine that and try to picture the fear and despair. When the book of Revelation was written, Rome was the sole military, economic, and political power in the New Testament world. There were other powers and empires out beyond its borders, but it, those were places that people could not go, that they couldn't flee to. They were in the world of Rome. The government of Rome exercised absolute power over the people under its rule. There was no self-determination or religious freedom. There were only two types of religions. There were illegal religions, which was the majority of religions, and then there were legal religions, which were a tiny minority that uh, had some privileges along with the Roman state called religio licita, and religio illicita. Christianity in its first few centuries was a religio illicita, an illegal religion. And hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children were executed, or worse, they were tortured to death for their faith. Yet, here we are today. Because of the martyr's faith and because of the martyr's faithfulness, that not even the might of Rome could extinguish. Those brave men and women were real people, and the weight of the injustice they were going through, the weight of the cruelty upon them was crushing. Like any other flesh and blood people, they asked, How long? Why? God, where are you? Why the pain? Why this cruelty? Why this injustice? Just as there are people around the world today suffering, asking those same questions. It is into that vortex of terror, that maelstrom of fear, that black night of injustice that the book of Revelation speaks. And while we might not be at that moment uh, in Western civilization at this moment. There are seasons like that in our lives. We're on a 
micro scale, not a macro scale. We are victims of cruelty. We are victims of abuse. We are victims of injustice. And the same questions come into our mind. How long? Why? God, where are you? Why the pain? Why the cruelty? Why the misery? Why the injustice? I've outlined, uh, as a survey of the book of Revelation, nine morning messages for here at Agora Church and uh, would like to invite you to join us for that to survey the capstone book of the Bible. Now, there are two equally wrong approaches to the book of Revelation. One is kind of how reform, the reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin uh, approached it. For them, essentially, they ignored it as too mysterious, too unknowable for extensive commentary. So if you get the writings of Luther or you get the commentaries of John Calvin, you'll uh, be frustrated trying to find the one on Revelation because they simply avoided it. They couldn't fit it into the rest of their theological structures. Now, uh, other than avoiding, there's another wrong approach, and that is to approach it as though every detail of it can be mastered, that there is no mystery there, that it isn't prophecy like other prophecy that lets us await for its fulfillment to know it in detail, but to believe that through Time Magazine and a few urban legends on the internet, we can parse every single de detail of the book, we can remove every mystery, and we can be masters of what it says. Neither of those are true. The book is knowable. Its main message, uh, much of what it's trying to accomplish as revelation is clear. At the same time, like all prophecy before its fulfillment, there's fuzziness. There are things that we think could be this, but maybe not. It could like, like this. And until the pieces of history come together, we don't know for sure. And so to approach the book, we have to have both confidence, confidence that it's part of the Bible, that it will edify us and build us up if we study it, that there's clarity to it on the things that are needed, and we have to also have humility. We must make sure that we're not some kind of snake oil salesman, uh, arrogantly dazzling people with our speculations, but ultimately... Uh, leaving them disillusioned after we have scintillated them. Humility does not mean that the book's message is unknowable. Its very title promises us that it is. In Greek, the title of this book is Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis. We get the word apocalypse from it. And apocalypse comes from two Greek words. The first part, apo, means from. The last part, kalupsis, means veil. And when you put them together, it, it is uh, our English word, unveiled. And the book of Revelation promises to be an unveiling. Now, it is not called the revelation of the future or the revelation of the last days. It is called the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The book is about him much more than it is about the details of the future. And this is really gets to the heart of the central message. In the pain of those people suffering under persecution, God knew what they needed. They didn't need intellectual details or facts. They needed clarity concerning who Jesus was. Like all other issues of theology and life for the Christian, the central answer is Jesus. Jesus. And so the book is called The Unveiling of Jesus. And it's important for Christians to turn to this book 
especially after we read the Gospels and see Jesus in all his earthly humility, we need to read this book as well. Because as you heard in this first chapter, it reveals Jesus in the magnitude of his rule. And so for a message summary today, I have uh, taken a statement from Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, where he said, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. As somebody stands in the bankruptcy court, as somebody stands at the funeral home, as somebody sits in front of the diverse divorce attorney, as somebody is at the side of the hospital bed, as we go through these dark moments of life, the one word we have to remember from Jesus are these words, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. When somebody asks the question, where was God when? And they list the thing that happened. When this happened to me. Where was God when this happened to me? Where was God when this happened to me? The answer is always the same. He was with you. He was with you and caring for you. That's ultimately the answer of the book of Revelation to people in suffering is... Jesus. Jesus with us. And so, as we looked at this book, I read to you these uh, first uh, three verses. They are inspired scripture, but they were probably written by a disciple of John, and John's actual words begin in verse 4, so we kind of have two inspired authors for the book of Revelation. But here in uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we not only get the title, we get that emphasis concerning Jesus, we get these words in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the works of this prophecy. Now, notice it says, blessed is the one. Uh, you did have printing presses in the early days, producing Writings was difficult. Not everybody could carry a Bible. Often a church only had one or two written copies of a book or two of the Bible in the earliest days. And so there was uh, limited access to Scripture. And so what the church did was, what we do here each Sunday at Agora, there would be a lector, there would be a person who would read, right? And it would be one person. So... Uh, the person who prepared these first three verses pronounced a blessing. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this book, and blessed are those who hear it. Now, not just hear it, and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. I guess the main point is not just the mechanics of how the early church uh, delivered scripture to people, not principally in written form, but uh, uh, in a spoken word where the lector read to the people, but I wanted to focus on another word we had in these verses, blessed. The book of Revelation is not supposed to frighten people, although sadly I've seen it used that way. The book of Revelation is supposed to bless people. And so for my outline today, one of the things I've, the way I've structured it is I want to point out three beliefs that will help you be blessed by the book of Revelation. The first one I've uh, already talked about, and that is you have to believe that the book is clear in its central message and content. Now, in here, it does say that the book communicates by symbols, right? Uh, John intentionally communicates in a symbolic manner, and he, he uses a form of literature 
that takes its name from the book of Revelation called apocalyptic literature. Even though it existed before the book of Revelation, we have it with the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, which is quoted numerous times in Revelation. We have it with the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, which is quoted numerous times in the book of Revelation. And it's a type of literature that draws symbols. And it draws uh, symbols from three sources. It draws symbols from the Old Testament. It draws symbols from nature. It draws symbols from the culture of that day. And then this symbolic book delivers what is a clear and central message, and that is this. God will triumph over evil. I wish it said, good will triumph over evil. But it doesn't say that. It says God will triumph over evil. Because many times as we go through life, as the, period, as the people who are alive in that period we're experiencing, good doesn't always defeat evil in the short term. Evil has all kinds of advantages of savagery and cruelty and deceit and wickedness. And in many ways and in many times, in the short term, you see evil triumph for a season. But the book of Revelation tries to remind people going through that experience that in the end, God will triumph over evil. So if you want to be blessed by the book of Revelation, Keep the belief in your heart that the book is clear in its central message and content that in the end, God wins. In the end, God wins. Now, to understand the book of Revelation as well, and it's already been hinted at who in this title, right? The revelation, the unveiling of what? Jesus Christ. And you have to believe in order to be blessed by this book that Jesus is God the Son. Now usually we say Son of God because that's the messianic title and that's how it's used. But in many ways in the book of Revelation, it'll help us if we reverse those words and say God the Son. The book of Revelation as I read and here in the first chapter goes to great lengths where Jesus is saying in verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. We see Jesus here as we don't see him in the Gospels. We see Jesus in the Gospels uh, humble. We see him veiled in human flesh. We see him uh, bowing before, uh, kneeling before his disciples to wash their feet. In the book of Revelation, we see Jesus with his divinity unmasked. We see Jesus with brilliant white hair with a face like the sun. We see the divinity that had been veiled in the Gospels, veiled in his incarnation on earth. We see it unveiled. And for people who are suffering, they have to see him that way. They have to see him with what uh, verse 5 of this chapter says. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. In chapter 19, he is what? The king of kings and the Lord of lords. As they were suffering under Roman oppression, it was so important for them to hear there's a power above. There's a power above the wicked ruler that is ruining your life. There's a power that will hold him accountable. There's a power that will bring purpose out of as, uh, what you see as chaos. There's a power that as your church is extinguished, as every family in it is murdered and killed, as the witness of Christ that was growing up in your little town in the Roman Empire disappears 
and others have to come back in and reignite the flame of the gospel. As you watch those things happen, know that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And in the end, God will win. The Bible makes and asserts that claim that Jesus is God in human flesh. He is God with us. He is God among us. He is God for us. And in the main point of chapter 1, we look at him in the complementary way to the Gospels. We look at him not through the filter of his humanity. We look at him in his unfiltered divinity. A third belief that you need to have if you want to be blessed by the book of Revelation is this belief that Jesus stands with his people through thick and thin. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Now, John is in exile on a tiny island. It's it's not a prison. There are beaches and fields. A, a little fishing town was there. But it was an effective way to take somebody who'd become a powerful regional and community leader and to isolate them, to put them with a tiny population, with a small Roman garrison so that his voice could not come out. And so in that place where he has limited ability to influence others. There's a lot of time to walk and, and think and reflect and pray. And during one of those times in tradition, it's, uh, it happens in a little cave uh, on a, a hillside overlooking the harbor. Uh, we don't know wherever it was. We know it was on that island. And there he uh, had a vision that communicated him with, through symbols. It's not an unusual thing in the Bible especially the Old Testament, and those symbols came to him. And we saw uh, some of those here in the first chapters. I read to them in verse 12. He said, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Now, as we get through the book of Revelation, We'll have to talk on symbols of time and what they mean. And remember, I said earlier, symbols uh, came from nature in the book. Symbols came from the Old Testament, and they came from the culture of that day. In the culture of that day, lighting wasn't provided by candles. It wasn't provided by uh, LED electric light bulbs. It was provided by olive oil lamps. And uh, these oil lamps were little tiny ceramic vessels where there was one hole to put the olive oil in, another hole where a wick would be, a woven wick would stick out, and it would soak up the olive oil and you'd light it, and it would burn uh, with kind of a nice, uh, kind of, uh, we're cooking Italian this uh, week, or cooking Greek this week kind of smell, and it would give a little bit of light and, and last for a period of time. And so that was what a lamp was. For it to be useful, you had to get it up at some elevation, right? Uh, there would be niches in the wall, uh, little holes in the wall like shelves, and you'd slide the lamp in there, and you'd light it, you'd slide it in there, and it would kind of light out toward the room. Or if the room was uh, larger, the area was larger, you would have a special piece of furniture, a lamp stand, almost always made of wood for most people. For some people who were extremely wealthy, they could be made out of uh, metal. In this case, they're made out of gold, right? There's a lampstand that is made out of gold. Now, a lampstand is a wonderful symbol because the lampstand does not give you light. The lamp gives you light. The purpose of the lampstand is to hold the light up so that it can be seen. Now, what is this lampstand? What are these seven lampstands that we see the Son of God, we see Jesus walking among and being among at the time of suffering for these people? Verse 20 explains it to this. 
the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand out of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John needed a symbol for the church, so he said, hmm, I'm not going to use a lamp or a light. Jesus has already done that for individual Christians and said that they're kind of a light to others. I'm going to use a lampstand. The vision God has given me is that the church is a lampstand. It holds the light up, the light of the gospel, the light of truth, the light of Jesus. It holds it up so that it can be seen. That's a nice detail. We understand something. Let's circle back. This book isn't so much about churches and the church and the world. It's about Jesus. Where does John see Jesus in the time of trouble? He sees him walking among the lampstands, with the lampstands, with the churches. One of the biggest... Uh, surprises to us in faith is that our faith does not protect us. We kind of expect this quid pro quo where, God, I'm going to give you my belief, I'm going to give you my faith, I'm going to do some of the things you tell me to do, and surely, in exchange, you will make me happy. You will give me everything I want. That's the deal that I'm hoping for. For here. Let's make a deal. I believe in you. You bless me and give me everything I want. But what we find out in the journey of faith is it doesn't work that way. Faith doesn't change the reality of an unjust world. Faith doesn't change the reality of the imperfection and struggles of life. What faith does is instead of changing our reality, it more often transforms our perspective. The book of Revelation is written to people who are afraid, people who are defeated, people who are abused, people who feel beaten down. And it does not promise them in the midst of their struggle and crisis a way out of that crisis. It promises them a way through it. It doesn't promise them a way out of it. It promises them a way through it. The 23rd Psalm doesn't say, Yea, though I walk around the valley of death. Yea, though I fly over the valley of death. doesn't say it. It says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of death of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? David said it a thousand years before John said it. Because you are with me. You are with me. That is the point of the book of Revelation. That in the midst of any struggle God's people go through, Jesus is with us. He is with us. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that we would be blessed by this central message of the book of Revelation. That even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. Lord, I'm kind of choked up at the end because I'm, I'm preaching this message and I've looked out at my sister, Nikki Smetters, I've looked out at my wife, Debbie, and I think of the terrible accidents that threatened their lives and what they've been through, how it frightened me. And yet, 
You were with all of us who love them, and you were with them. Lord, this message is not abstract. There's nothing scintillating about it. There certainly isn't anything frightening about it. Life takes care of frightening us enough. This message is central to our faith. That, lo, you are with us always, even to the end of the world. Thank you for that kind of faithfulness. Thank you for that kind of love. Comfort our hearts every day and in the darkest of days when we need that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you are blessed by the words of Scripture. And you are blessed today by Jesus. Thank you.